The book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, which is found on page 836 of your pew Bibles. Will you please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel? John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're at the beginning of the new year, and we are also beginning anew in the Bible. First, we heard part of the creation story from Genesis, and then we went to the beginning of Mark for the start of Jesus' ministry with his baptism by John. The new is off and running. How many of you have already put away your Christmas decorations? Most of you. Same with my house. One of the first things my wife said to me in the new year was, will you bring up all the containers from the basement so I can put the Christmas things away? I get it. We have a day off to get things done and to prepare for and usher in the new year. But to me, it's kind of sad that we are through with Christmas so soon. The decorations are boxed up and put away for another year until it's time to bring them back out to gear up for another run to another Christmas. We're into the new year and back into our daily grind with the possible exceptions of the New Year's resolutions which have not yet been broken. We have high hopes for the new year and hope to put the old year behind us as quickly as possible. And to some extent, that's understandable. But I have to wonder why we are so eager to put Christmas behind us. The gift of the Christ changed the world, and it should be celebrated throughout the whole year. But here we are only two weeks later, and the lectionary has us on to the baptism of the adult Jesus the birth of the infant God and the virgin birth is over and done with and we are on to more adult things. I suppose it's the way of the world to move on to the newish things and try to leave the old behind us. That brings us back to the scene at the River Jordan. Not just a solitary figure this time, but a throng of people from all walks of life are there. They have made a mini pilgrimage into the countryside. They have come to see an itinerant preacher who is more than strange, with a coarse camel's hair tunic and a leather belt around his waist, the uniform of a prophet since the days of Elijah. It was longing and anticipation that brought this mass of people out. There was a sense that something was missing from their walk with God, so they were ready to listen to a new voice. And this is a powerful voice. You brood of vipers, who warned you to run from the anger of God that is coming on you? Clean up your act 
And do not presume to rely on the fact that you are Israelites, God's chosen people to save you. Get right and do right. The crowds asked what to do. And John responded, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none and whoever has food must do likewise. The tax collectors were told, collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. And the soldiers were instructed, do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusations and be satisfied with your wages, as we are told in Luke. It was a message that affirmed what they already knew. If they would be right with God, they had to be right not only with God, but with God's children as well. Time to make a commitment. As a sign of their resolve to repent and make a change, they came down to the river and allowed John to bury their old ways under the water in baptism and then raise them up anew to a better life. And in the hands of a dynamic personality, so forceful and impressive, they were led to think that John was the promised Messiah who had finally come. But John debunked that notion out of hand. The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then one day it happened. Jesus came with his request for baptism. And there was John's initial reluctance and then his acquiescence. And finally, the dramatic climax. As our reading has it, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart. Not just open, the Greek shazamai means split, ripped, sundered. And then the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And the voice sounded from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. What an image. It's as if God the Father is confined to heaven at this fantastic moment and in euphoric frustration rips and tears the very fabric of the universe in order to lay claim upon Jesus, the Son. It's a cosmic yes, arms raised high and feet dancing. It's love spilling out and God's cup overflowing. Not celebrating the conclusion of a work well done, but celebrating before anything was done. And Jesus was now about to embark upon his ministry. This changes everything. Jesus' baptism ushered in a new baptism for all of us. Christian baptism became not just a, a washing away of sin as John's baptism was, but the baptism that brings the power of the Holy Spirit and a special relationship with God. Why? For no other reason than God chooses to do it. Yes, baptism is more of an act of God than an act of man, for it's done in the power of God in cooperation with human will to take part in this holy act. Jesus didn't need John's baptism for the forgiveness of his sins. Jesus didn't have any sins to be forgiven. Jesus needed the power of God in his life and in his ministry. Jesus didn't minister in the power of John. And John didn't affirm Jesus and his ministry after his baptism, God did. Both John and God were active in Jesus' baptism, just as God is the active power in each of our baptisms. 
part of the message of Jesus' baptism and our own is that we are loved. Most folks understand that. It's why they get all warm and fuzzy when it comes to presenting their little ones for the sacrament of baptism. But there is more. We have work to do. Remember, Jesus' baptism started at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This was his commissioning service. And now, more than 20 centuries later, when someone is baptized in the church, whether infant or adult, it's no different. We still have work to do. We are receiving our commissioning. We're ready now to leave the starting line. And if that scares you a bit, there's one more piece of good news that I have for you about your baptism. I'd like you to picture that event with John at the Jordan. There's the crowd. There's John. There's Jesus. And then the dove. The Holy Spirit. Don't forget about the dove. Clearly, Mark wants us to understand that from this moment on, Jesus and his ministry are empowered by the living presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there is something powerful in baptism. Baptism is not an end to anything. It's just the beginning. We have said, yes, Lord, I want to be a part of you, and I want you to be an active part and power in my life. When parents have their children baptized, they're saying, God, I'm dedicating my child to you, that they may live a holy life worthy of the name Christian. And I am pledging myself to be an active part in helping my child to live and grow up in that way. I'm surprised by the number of people that I have seen at various churches that just kind of appear when they want their child or children to be baptized and then aren't seen or heard from again except maybe Easter and Christmas until it's time for confirmation. Friends, baptism and confirmation are not an end unto themselves. It's not some sort of spiritual inoculation it will last a lifetime. It's just the beginning of our spiritual journeys. It takes work and the support of other Christians and the presence of God in our lives. We cannot walk this walk or live this life on our own or by our own power. God declared at Jesus' baptism, you are my son, the beloved, with you, I am well pleased. Now go and show them what this is all about. Jesus' baptism wasn't the end. It was the beginning of his ministry, and our baptism is the beginning of our Christian lives. There is no question that there are multitudes and magnitudes of things to get us down during our lives. The message of Jesus' baptism, and yours and mine as well, is that we have the power of God within us. We have the power to both be different and to make a difference in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Remember your baptism with a sense of awe. Remember God's power in your life. Remember who and whose you are. You are a beloved son or daughter of God, and God is well pleased to claim you as God's own. But God does not live our lives for us. 
we must live into our baptism. We must live into and claim each day for ourselves the name of Christian. We have work to do, but we do not have to do it alone any more than Jesus did. Throughout Jesus' ministry, God was just a prayer away. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he walked and ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was strengthened every moment and every day by the presence of God with him. And we can be too if we trust and believe in the power of our baptism and the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. In his baptism, God said to Jesus, Thou art my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In our baptism, God says to us, You are my dear sons and daughters, with whom I want to be well pleased. You are my dear children. I love you and forgive you. Now go forth and act like it. Remember who and whose you are. Throughout the Bible, God and Jesus say that they will never leave us or forsake us. It's part of the promise of our baptism. Let us live like we believe it, starting our Christian journey anew this day and every day. Amen.